And these guys are all being extraordinarily modest. Um, they've all dedicated, they're some of the best marine scientists in the field, and they've all dedicated years of their lives to this Marine Life Protection Act um, in the state of California. So we're really glad to have them take yet another gorgeous Sunday out of their lives to be here and share um, some of the exciting work that we're doing. So now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to give you a really brief primer of Marine Protected Area Science 101. And then I'm going to hand it over to these guys to uh, go into more detail about these are the guys and their teams who are out there in the field actually collecting the information to find out how these marine protected areas in California are actually working. And this thing is really... So what are marine protected areas? Caitlin Gaffney gave you um, a bit of an overview of that, but I just want to reiterate the point that marine protected areas come in lots of different flavors. So like the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary, that's a marine protected area. One of the only things you can't do in there is drill for oil. And there's lots of other types of marine protected areas that vary with the level of restriction. And what we put up here are the um, different types of state marine um, protected areas that California instated, including marine reserves, which are the most restrictive type. That's where you can't do anything um, at all in terms of taking of marine life. This is what the Central California coast um, looks like with the 29 different marine protected areas going from Año Nuevo. Let's see if I can use this. No, of course, I'm technologically challenged. But there you see Año Nuevo up in the north, and it goes all the way down to uh, Vandenberg. The ones in blue are state marine conservation areas where you can do commercial and recreational activities in some of those. And then the red ones are the state marine reserves, which are the no-take areas. So 15 of these 29 are no-take, and you can see that they're all fairly small um, in size and represent 7.5% of the total study area. Well, so what are the benefits of marine reserves? And when we say marine reserves, it's just important to remember we're talking about those no-take areas. And there's been lots of studies around the world that have looked at the importance of marine reserves and what do they actually do. And what you're looking at on the bottom graph there in the left is there's some data from Glover's Reef in Belize and Jardimas de la Reina in Cuba. And this is looking at lobster biomass and fish abundance. And what you typically see in marine reserves, and this has been demonstrated in lots of different places around the world, is that there's higher numbers of organisms. Those things typically are larger in size. There's more different species of them, and there's increase in biomass. So this is what we're hoping to get from these different areas. Um, how do they work? So this is sort of the um, hypothetical conceptual map of how marine protected areas work. If you look at this over on the right hand side, imagine that this is your marine reserve where there's complete protection. And what you have is you have organisms, whether it's crustaceans or fish, those guys get complete protection. They get bigger. They have babies. Those babies go out into the water column and are distributed or dispersed is the word that's used. And then you get a lot of organisms building up in there and they get crowded and they go outside. So you're looking at both movement of larvae, which are the babies, and also of adults. And that's what we call spillover. So you have conservation benefits inside and then you have these fisheries benefits that occur outside. So that's how they're supposed to work. Um, and here's just looking at how spillover works. You, have, you can expect spillover to vary depending on the different species. So if you have some species that are more mobile than others, you'd expect to see more benefits um, or less benefits depending on how much movement there is. So here if you look on the right hand side, you have the reserve. You have buildup of those different species. Here we're looking at lingcod and rock fish and surf perch. And then they build up and they move outside. And how much they move around inside and outside the reserve, again, is going to depend um, on their mobility as a species. So another thing that's important in the design of um, marine protected areas, and this has been applied to the California um, Marine Life Protection Act design, is that there's you need to think about how marine organisms live in different places throughout their life cycle. So adults might live in one habitat, then they have babies, those babies go out into the water column. They might settle in a completely different habitat as juveniles, 
and then adults move around, and you see this cycle um, repeated throughout um, their life history. And this is really important in terms of designing networks of marine protected areas, and that's what the state of California has actually done. So rather than come up with putting a single large reserve along the state of California, what the state has done is try to design this network of smaller reserves um, along the entire coast. And here you're looking at when they're talking about dispersal of young. So if you look at the red area on the left-hand side, so this is called a dispersal envelope, where those larvae you could predict would actually go to. And you see you're looking at a smaller area of coast on the left-hand side than if you put these little um, networks of reserves on the right-hand side. You see that you have dispersal of larvae all along the coast. This is also really important is think of if you had an oil spill in one of those marine reserves. So this is kind of vet hedging also by putting these um, protected areas all along the California coast. If you had one reserve that was taken out by an oil spill or a climate change event, this way you have um, sort of built-in protection. Another thing that's really important is the importance of protecting larger, older fish. So what you're looking at here on the left-hand side, you're looking at the reproductive potential or how many babies does a mom have? Um, and that varies with size. So in fish, what we found is actually the bigger moms actually have many, many more um, larvae or offspring. So if you're a rockfish and you're 14 inches long, you're only going to produce 150,000 individuals. Whereas if you let her grow up to be 24 inches, she's actually going to produce 1.7 million um, Offspring. So this is really, really important because who do we target as fishing, as fishermen? We go for the big guys, right? And those mothers are very important um, for our population. So um, a little bit of lesson in um, fish ecology. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to our specialists. I'd like to um, recognize our partners. Long Marine Lab, the Seymour uh, Discovery Center, and I know a lot of you are docents for California State Parks, and thank you all. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Mark, I think now, is going to give us a little introduction.